We are back with another live episode of Bully Ball on the Gold Standard Podcast Network. That's Steph Sanchez. I'm Jason Aponte, and I'm a fan of a baseball team that hasn't lost a game. Steph Sanchez, it feels great, baby. I don't care about baseball, man. What are we even doing? Can you here? just can you just go with it? Can you just <laughs> go with it? Okay. It must be tough to like a baseball team that is not undefeated because I don't know how you do it. Personally, I wouldn't tolerate it. In my opinion, I wouldn't put up with that. But hey, at to each their own. Um, Steph, it's good to see you off of a little bit of a hiatus, huh? You, yeah, yeah. And um, not me. But <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's good to see you, man. Don't leave me with Rob ever again. I'm just kidding. Yeah, why do you keep saying Rob's that? in Is the back? Bad? Rob, no, I'm just joking. Rob's in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Rob's in, and <laughs> it was funny because I know Rob like he'll remember me saying things like that and he thinks I like hate him or something. I'm just joking. It's just so Felt easy perfect. to Yeah, it, it's so easy to mess with Rob. I just have to do someone, it. Someone <laughs> someone screenshot that face and keep it and 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 use it for any time Rob puts up a take that you disagree with. You know, that's that's absolute gold. It's perfect, guys. Um, um memeing aside, there are some things that have been going on with the 49ers, clearly. Obviously, that's what we're here to talk about. We are going to get into my 1.0 mock draft, um, so you guys can yell at me and call me an idiot for saying that this player is not going to be there, this player is not going to be there. But I promise you that I have good reasons for the players that I've taken and why I've taken them there. But let's start with Brock Purdy doubling basic, basically his salary by just playing football. And... <laughs> Seven hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars, seven hundred thirty-nine thousand seven hundred ninety-five dollars. That's literally his year's salary, based on the NFL's performance-based pay program. You know, Diamantola Nor got a little bit of money. Brock Purdy might be able to afford himself a apartment by himself finally in the Bay Area with this new uh, extra money, huh? Yeah, finally he doesn't need a roommate anymore to uh, you know live with, and you know, much deserved uh, for Brock. You know, definitely. You know, him being severely underpaid uh, these last two seasons, but especially last year, him being like a full time starter now. And I mean, he he definitely deserves it. Couldn't have happened to a, a more qualified player, I guess, who can get these uh, performance based uh, bonuses. So definitely happy for Brock. He's a married man now, too. So. Um, it's just a great off season for him. He was uh, Turks and Caicos. I mean, the man is is living right now. Yeah. Imagine leading your team and coming back after the NFC Championship and going back to your room and then having a knock on the wall like, "Hey, keep it down over there, roommate. <laughs> I I need to get some sleep." <laughs> uh, but that's just who, the nature. Who do you think of... was doing the knocking? You think you think uh, Brock's roommate who was Nick Zakel? Right? Think it's McKibbitt. Kibitz is, his, is it McKibbitz? Okay. No, yeah. no, it's it's someone else. It's or I think it's offense. definitely a lineman. It's one of the offensive linemen. Yeah. So who do you think is knocking on whose whose door? Like, hey, buddy. Ah, it's enough. See, you know what? The tables have turned. Imagine, like, you know, like guys are just like, hey, man, I'm just trying to get some sleep, and you're like, literally one of the best married, quarterbacks. Now he's a married man. So like, uh, we're not gonna get work? into that. Yeah. How does that work? Because like, does he does he bring his wife over to the crib, and he got a roommate? Like, mm, how does that work? Do you wonder if the roommate and him have to have like that sock on the door type um type arrangement? You know, like it's it's just strange. they got like it's a schedule strange. that they adhere by. It's, it's Nick Zakel, right? It's Nick Zakel. Thank you for for fixing that. It's, it's Nick Zakel, but yeah, does the, the Zakel and and Brock have to do the whole like sock on the door thing? Like, hey man, if you see the sock on the door, like tread lightly, or you know, uh, it's it's just it's kind of interesting. Yeah. That's the breakdown we need. I don't know why the Bay Area doesn't ask questions like this more than anything. You want hard-hitting questions about football. I want to know what the roommate living situation is between Brock Purdy and Nick Sakel because I find it fascinating that someone who literally went to a Super Bowl probably has to tread lightly around his roommate and has to show respect and stuff. And I wonder if Nick Sakel's eating his stuff out of the fridge. Maybe he's eating some of his stuff out of the fridge. I need he's the dynamics write his name. of this. He's got to write right. his name on he's his He's got to write his name. Brock's orange juice, you know, like that type of thing. Like, are they the odd couple? Do they have like a line down the apartment? Like that, those are the things that people need to be asking. No one cares about the football game. Tell me about your your roommate. <laughs> What's going on with that? Anyway, it's good for Brock Purdy. He needs that money desperately, especially since he's married now and possibly could find himself a new place. Diamador Lenore got himself a little bit of money as well, too. And I think it's interesting because Diamador Lenore has a has a trajectory this season of 
just going up and then just being completely solid for the entire season. $790,744 for Diamador Lenore. Uh, went from being outside, kicked inside, and literally had a season in which he just got better and better. And looks like the 49ers have hit on a cornerback like Diamador Lenore. I, I think that's that's a great sign. And also, it's kind of indicative of how he's been playing this season and how good he was this year because I feel like it's been lost. and It kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah, another person who definitely deserves this. And, you know, he's a he's going to be a free agent after the 2024 season. So, you know, he gets this little bit of money now. But, you know, it remains to be seen if the 49ers are going to pay him an extension after that. I hope they do. But, you know, Lenore, for, for all he's he's put in these last couple of years, he's been pretty integral to, you know, the secondary improving this past season. So, you know, I, I just hope he's a Niner for uh, a lot longer than, you know, just 2024. Yeah, and the 49ers haven't drafted a cornerback in the first two rounds since 2014. Jimmy Ward, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I understand I he's a safety was- guys, but remember yeah. initially – he was a cornerback. So let's make sure we do the knowledge and do the science and make sure we get it right. But uh, my mock draft is coming out at the end here. Spoiler alert, I did not select a cornerback with my first round pick. But we'll get into that a little bit later. But I think you'll be happy with what I said. You know, I think we should be good with that. Okay. No offseason is set without free agency drama or contract extension drama. And obviously, I'm talking about Brandon Ayuk. And Brandon Ayuk went on the Shannon Sharp and Ocho Cinco, Ocho Cinco show. God, words are hard. Nightcap, which I think is phenomenal. I think that Shannon Sharp is doing a great job, and so is Ocho. I think they're a great uh, team, and I think their their show is great. I usually tune in as much as I can late night. But Brandon Ayuk was essentially talking about how much he wants to get paid, what he deserves. Uh, Rob, do we have the clip so we can uh, we can directly quote uh, Mr. Ayuk without uh, you know having to? So I guess paraphrase is the word. Um, but I, I think again, it's like. This stuff I'm not worried about at all. You know, this all all this like what you're gonna hear in this audio is is not something that's concerning to me. They trying to get work done. They trying to get work done. I mean, they trying to get work done. Uh, are you? That's that's, are that's, you? that's 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 all I that's all I can say. Uh, y'all know how y'all know how it gets. I don't even yeah. want to. I don't even want to get too far into that. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I'm just trying to. Uh, I'm just trying to get like like. Like what Ocho just said, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to get what I what I deserve. I felt like this season, um, this season playing football, I figured out who I was as a person, as a player, what I bring to the table, what I bring to the locker room, what I bring um, to the organization, um, and just the value I hold when I walk in that building because um, people are gonna follow me because I've done it the right way since I've been in that building from the, from from, the, from, the, from the, the first day I walked in there to when I was in there earlier this morning, I've done it the right way. So. Um, and if, 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 if they don't see a word in that, that's all, that's all it is. That's all yeah. it is. It ain't nothing else. It ain't nothing else besides that. But I can't, like I said, I can't get into it. Um, we got professionals working on both sides. So hopefully we can come to a professional agreement and, uh, continue to play professional football. So right off the bat, the first thing that jumps out is I've done the right thing since I walked in the building. And since I was there this morning, so Brandon, Ayuk's working out. In Santa Clara. Good sign. Okay. And the 49ers track record of extending players is right before training camp. Now, what's going to happen before training camp, Steph Sanchez? A bunch of money is about to open up because of Eric Armstead's post 6-1 release. Right now, this is a lot of noise because they really are just trying to feel out where he is in terms of this money. But by the time that money from Eric Armstead's contract comes about 6-2, They'll be able to start really getting into it. I'm not worried about this on April 2nd. I'm sorry, Steph. I just I I hate I hate to dismiss it because I know it's a talking point and a lot of people are are worried. And it's just we've gone through this though. We've gone yeah. through this with Debo Samuel and Nick Bosa holding out. And like we, it they'll get it done. I am not worried about it. But I have no issue with Brandon Ayuk saying that he wants to get what he deserves. I think every single football player should feel like that, especially when this game doesn't love you back. They don't send you off with a parting gift. They don't send you off with a gift basket. They don't send you off with a a package of of money like to go. So you got to get every single dollar that you can get. Everything's going to be fine, Steph. 
In my opinion, the part that was more so concerning was Ocho uh, telling Ayuk he, he should be trying to get $30 million <laughs> plus. I was like, yo, slow down, man. Slow down. <laughs> I don't know about all that. But, no, I, I agree with you. And I almost feel like, you know, me and you were always on the same page about this. I mean, I, I almost feel like I'm repeating myself over and over and I'm getting boring because, like, I keep telling people, like, this is no reason to panic. Like we know in March and April, even in February, Hey, even, even next month, we're going to be saying the same thing. Like we know this is how the process goes. And there's going to be several, many reports, several other interviews from IUK maybe uh, between now and the time that the, the extension takes place where there is going to be a little bit of like, Mm, feelings from fans like why don't they just get this done but like at the end of the day it's always the same thing it'll happen when it, it it'll happen and it's going to happen as we know closer to training camp so right now in these months this is a nothing burger you know so we we gotta let the process play out as it does um and you know it, it's really nothing more than that and you know we're, we're also getting more um more reports about oh they're far apart in negotiations oh like they're this much apart in negotiations again it it's it's april and <laughs> of course they're far apart in negotiations right now uh you know iuk wants one thing the 49ers want something and they're going to chip away at that till they meet somewhere in the middle that's that's how every negotiation goes so Right now, it's early. I know they're they're talking. It's great. Ayuk is in the building. That's obviously a good sign. But he also wants to make it clear and use his voice to say, like, hey, it, yes, I'm here, and I'm going to do everything the right way like I have been. But if you don't value me, like he said, you know, he's cool with walking away, which, you know, he should, you know, share that sentiment because that is his leverage, and that's kind of the only leverage he really has, right? So. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, he's playing it the right way. I know he's, he's been saying some things and maybe trolling here and there, but at the end of the day, he wants to get paid. The 49ers, I think are, are willing to do that and, and meet him at a certain number. So we'll see in a few months what that number is, but I'm not worried about any of this right now. Yeah. Again, uh, it's April 2nd, you know, this, this money that's about to come out is, is in June. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. And and again, any possible extension will actually clear up more cap space for the 49ers. This is all just a part of the plan, right? Um, with Bosa, Bosa was never really talking to anyone. With Debo, Debo was doing his things through social media. So it necessarily is just playing out differently for all three of them. But it's essentially the same idea with the way that they're looking to get paid. And a lot of people who are upset with, you know, why are you talking to the media or why are you doing this on social media? This is the new age of contract negotiations. This is the new way to create pressure, to create noise, to create discussion around it, right? And get it a little bit more traction is because of social media. So when you see someone strip away their entire social media of all 49 and stuff, well, he gone, right? Oh my God, he gone. Like, no, like that's just, it's it's a part of the process. Everyone is literally doing these things. Um, it's just how it goes about it. I'm sure their agents are encouraging it because it only brings more attention to the situation. But I'm not too worried about it. I'm not too worried about it at this point. Now, I did see a mock draft, and I want to throw this off to you real quick. I did see a mock draft um, by Bleacher Report in which the 49ers took Xavier Leggett with the 31st pick, which implies it, it that that gives the implication that then Brandon Ayuk would go out, you know, in some way, and they would get something for him. Now, the trade wasn't made on draft day, so I don't know what they were really thinking with that one. So in my opinion, they're just ready to let him walk for nothing. Um, or right. Like it's, it was, if you trade him on draft day and you get a higher pick, I understand that. Right. Then, you know, you can have it. The only thing I want to do, and I want to get greedy. If I was trading Brandon, I used to someone and getting a first round pick. I'm keeping 31 too. Like you're not getting 31 either. Give me a high pick, but I'm not giving you 31. You know, you, yeah. you we keep both. Let's double dip now. Like let's get greedy. And that's the type of blown you away offer that they should be looking for. But in this scenario, um, it had them taking Leggett, and they said very much like Debo Sam, very much like Brandon Ayuk, um, after the catch, you know, not like super explosive in terms of like, you know, down the field, but like almost the same type of receiver. 
that's the same strategy that they kind of employed after DeForest Buckner got traded. And then, you know, obviously we know what happened. But I thought that was kind of interesting. I thought that was an interesting way because I haven't seen anybody do it. But it wasn't with the 49ers trading him on draft day and getting another pick. I think they were just thinking, hey, they're just going to let him walk. And I don't think that they should do that at all. I, and I don't think they will, uh, honestly. Yeah. Like, if, if the 49ers go for a wide receiver with their first two picks, which is – you know, in the realm of possibility, I think it's more likely that, you know, the heads will turn towards Debo, right? Like, and, and you do solidify your wide receiver room for the future because you would have Brandon Ayuk under an extension and you're bringing in your new wide receiver two for 2025 and beyond. Um, Cause I think, or, or 2024 and beyond, depending on, you know, after June 1st, it becomes easier to trade Debo, but you can also have him play out 2024 and then you have an out in his contract after that. So, you know, there, there's some flexibility there. And so that's why I think like they, they could still draft a wide receiver fairly early. And there's definitely a number of names that are intriguing. Um, Leggett like, is interesting because, you know, to your point, like there are some similarities to Brandon Ayuk's game there. I think they, they'd they probably go with someone um, that would compliment him. So, uh, but it's possible, you know, it's, it's possible. And if they do go that route, then yeah, like I, I think uh, Debo's time uh, suddenly gets put on a timer uh, with San Francisco. And I think that's a lot of people's thinking is, you know, if you're going to do this, you don't move Ayuk. You wait one more year and then you and then you actually you get rid of Debo in what way. But again, uh, this is the part that I struggle with. And this is the part that I'm not going to speculate on because dead money, this, that, whatever it is like that part is where I struggle with it a little bit, where I'm just like, I, I don't know what that means, what that means for the for the cap. I stay away from those discussions, but I don't know if someone is going to value Debo again you know, like the way that they have. Um, I think it's it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be very interesting um, the way that this is going to play out. I had a chance to actually catch up with Mike Tannenbaum of uh, ESPN, um, former G- uh, Jets GM and actually a uh, former executive vice president of the Miami Dolphins. And he put out a mock draft and he chose Braden Fisk at 31. And that's interesting because Braden Fisk is, you know, he's going, he's being mocked as like a second rounder. Um, we mm-hmm. found out that his medicals w- were described as some of the poorest they've ever seen from anybody. So that seems like it's right up the 49ers alley to go ahead and, and get somebody like that. Um, but the way he described it was he said, I spent a bunch of time with Chris Kosarek in Miami. And this is exactly the player that Chris Kosarek would love to have. Guy who plays like his hair is on fire, defensive tackle. He said he he made a little joke before he started and said, um, the 49ers haven't signed a defensive lineman in about five minutes, which is, you know, <laughs> uh, which is kind of funny. I was like, oh, I was like, so everyone around the league looks at that as a joke, right? Um, but he chose Braden Fisk and he said that that's exactly what Coach K would want. And he said, that's exactly, he said, scheme fit everything, it would be fine. I think that's a little bit too high, but that's the first time I've seen anybody give him the, the, the 31 pick right there. Yeah, Fisk at 31. I'm I'm a huge fan of, of Fisk, by the way, just yeah. because like when you see his get off and we know the, the 49ers, Kasarik has coined the uh, GTFO, uh, <laughs> you know, get off. Yeah, get get that off. Um, I, I think he definitely fits that mold. That's kind of what he does best. But I agree. 31, definitely too early for him. Yeah. Now, the 49ers could you know, take a gamble and wait till their second round pick. They could even move up a little bit from their second round pick if that's the guy they want. But I don't know how I'd feel about them taking that big of a reach. Now, we we have seen the 49ers reach for guys who they feel very strongly about. Is Fisk that kind of player? You know, I, I don't know, right? There, there could be a, a lot of different defensive linemen that they feel strongly about, certainly in the past. It, it, it seems like defensive linemen have been the the ones that would get them to, you know, kind of reach. But yeah, that one's a little too rich. So I like Fisk, just not at 31. Uh, but, you know, just for the fact that the closer we get to the draft, the more and more I'm, I'm going back to, man, the 49ers just can't help themselves. But to go defensive lineman or go defensive player with that first pick. So you know, and taking a defensive tackle there, I guess like it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. So 
I did get a chance to talk with Mike Tannenbaum. That is on my YouTube channel. But I do want to play the audio of his scenario about Brandon Ayuk because there's no way that I was going to let him off the hook without um, asking him about Brandon Ayuk. So here's what he had to say about Brandon Ayuk's situation. If I was John Lynch, I, I just sit down with Kyle and say, look, what's a have to have and what's a, a, a nice to have? And someone's going to have to graduate here. And, you know, at some point, you know, you already heard Jed York come out yesterday or today and say, hey, you know, we're going to – we know Brock Purdy's deal is coming up. And, by the way, this is one of the reasons I would take J.J. McCarthy over Kyle Murray um, is for this very conversation. Look, we saw Tyreek Hill have to graduate from Kansas City um, because of Patrick Mahomes' contract. So at some point, you know, you're not going to be able to go get McCaffrey or Chase Young. You're going to – that's just – it's algebra. Like, there's just – that's the way it works. So, you know, for me, if we sign, you know, Brandon IU to an extension, that's fine. But, you know, Dre Greenlaw is going to have to go at some point. Somebody else is going to have to go. We can't keep Chase Young. Um, we have to go get Gross Matos or – whatever it is, like that's how you have sustainability is, you know, which guys can we identify that can graduate? And, um, you know, if we're identifying Brandon Ayuk as a difference maker, and I think he's a great player, you know, could we trade, you know, Debo Samuel in a year and draft, you know, the convenient thing would, okay, we're going to draft Xavier Leggett in the second round, let Debo graduate and give Debo's money to Brandon Ayuk. Those are the conversations you're having. And to their credit, they've drafted well so they can sort of do that and um, it's worked out for them. But those are constantly the conversations you're having is if we sign here, then, you know, we have to go short someplace else. I love graduate from nice to have and have to have. It's a nice to have player and have to have player. And I think that's what he was talking about with Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill's nice to have but you have to have Patrick Mahomes. And that's what he's talking about with graduating. And I think mm -hmm. that's the thought process. And I think that's kind of what makes this offseason so crucial for the 49ers. When you have yeah. someone as cheap as Brock Purdy, you're able to load up with all these guys. The window's not closing, but the window of you winning a Super Bowl with a quarterback that is super cheap and doesn't even count towards your cap, that's the, the sweet spot that you want to be in. That's what makes this draft so crucial. That's what makes this offseason so crucial, especially coming off the Super Bowl loss. That's And and then you're going to have to make these tough decisions down the line. And that's pretty much what Tannenbaum was talking about right there. Yeah, and, and we know the 49ers, you know, do a good job of staggering out the money in the extensions that they do have. So, you know, him saying, like, yeah, you're pretty much going to give Ayuk Debo's money in a year's time, you know, they'll have 2024 to play together. But, you know, after 2024, you know, maybe Ayuk's cap number would go up, but then you can, you can let Devo graduate, as he said. Um, and so that's how they kind of like to, to stagger things. So the 49ers have been, I, I would say like pretty smart in, in how they kind of like overlap some of their extensions and, and uh, the cap numbers for some of their star players. It's, been pretty creative i'd say but yeah i mean definitely a lot of changes coming in like if you thought a lot of changes came this year with eric armstead getting released i mean get ready buckle up buddy for for 2025 it's, it's gonna be a doozy steph says brace yourself bucko for this going forward make sure you quote that and put that up all right oh, can't wait to get yelled at for this i completed my first mock draft okay Guys, I have re reasoning for everything that I'm going to say. I don't want to hear that player is not going to be there, blah, blah, blah. Let's understand that the people who make mock drafts, they're never right, right? Never, almost never. Uh, the great Mel Kuyper misses all the time. You know, Matt Miller, all these guys, they miss, right? These are all speculative drafts. And when I was talking with somebody, uh, I, I believe it was Brian Peacock, actually. Shout out to him. Um, he said, the draft goes however you think it's going to go, and then someone throws a monkey wrench in it. Right. Like someone who you think is going to be pick 31 ends up being pick 15. And now the board completely changes. So the draft is not only ultimate crapshoot and just evaluating talent, it's the ultimate crapshoot and trying to predict what the hell is going to happen with all these picks. So let's just keep it calm. And this is just for conversation's sake. I've done the entire first round. I made one trade and I have reasonings for all of these things. By the way, before we get into this, the gold standard media ma madness bracket is now down to two. Brad Graham and Eric Crocker. Make sure you go to goldstandardniners.com and vote 
Shout out to Brad. Shout out to Croc. Felt like this was a collision course for this season because Croc is the, the 49ers Twitter king. And Brad Graham is doing such incredible work that this is his year to, to get to dance. So shout out to those guys and uh, vote for who you ever think is, is going to be the best. Steph, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who are you voting for? Oh God. Um, I, I didn't hear you say who you were voting for, but no, we talked about I'm it. Before for Brad. We... I'm voting for Brad. Yeah. yeah. Croc, okay. Croc yeah. We talked about it Croc before won. we went live. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to like steer away from that. Croc won I would already. say Brad just because yeah, Croc won last year, but that's not the reason I, I wouldn't vote for Croc this year. The reason I would vote for Brad though, is because, um, he just puts out so much content yeah. and on every social media platform. I don't even yeah. know how he does it. He's just so yeah. efficient. He's so quick with it. Um, and so, you know, he puts his all into it. So I, I'm gonna go with Brad just for the sheer amount of content that he puts out and it's great content too. So, um, you know, Croc puts out great stuff too. He has a, a great knowledge for the game. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna give the edge to, to Brad here. Hey, we love you both, Brad and, and Croc, but this is Brad's year, man. We're we're going with it, you know, and I've done lives with Brad where he'll just literally be looking down at his phone and it's him just making one of those posts for Instagram, like while we're doing a live. It's just, it's, it's insane. It's insane. So, and he probably gets right, it out in like two minutes. Like, he gets it out and like, he has like this, this, he just has a, like, it's muscle like memory. Like he might even have to look down. Like that's just, he's just locked in, man. All right, <laughs> let's get to it, uh, Rob. Uh, I can't wait to get yelled at for my mock draft. Let's do it. Um, I did make one trade. I got, I got the Minnesota Vikings into four so they can go get J.J. McCarthy. Obviously, Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, it feels like those are the most comfortable picks one way or another, obviously. I got the Vikings getting in to get J.J. McCarthy. I did take Joe Alt, and I understand that that looks crazy because they have no wide receivers, but I'm going on. I'm going off of Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh. We want to run the ball and offensive line is like I can hear them. Um, I can hear them robbling, robbling in the in the draft room. Like we need to get better in the trenches. Bah, 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 bah. So I took Joe up. Levy Marvin Harrison is six. Malik Neighbors is seven. Dallas Turner I think is locked in at Atlanta. Um, I think Seattle go. I'm um, Seattle. Uh, the Bears go with Udons, and I think uh the Jets try to address uh OT um Fashar. So I, I think these are my first ten um thoughts. Uh Stephanie Sanchez. Yeah, I definitely was going to ask you about the Chargers pick because I think like everyone kind of has them penciled in taking a wide receiver mm -hmm. and the way that, you know, the first four picks fall, like they would be getting Marvin Harrison. Like that's pretty hard to pass up. But then you also have a tackle, which, you know, Joel Alt being the top tackle in the draft as well. And, you know, you made you made some good points like they they do want to run the football that that's kind of like their bread and butter and i mean to be able to do that you need to have a solid offensive line that'll also help justin herbert as well i mean um he the part of the reason that he's struggled so much there is is you know part of the supporting cast around him not so much the wide receivers even though now he he has none <laughs> but you know just just everything else around him and you know i think they can solidify their defense a little bit more later in the draft so i'm i'm that one's like interesting. It could go either way. That right there is the monkey wrench you're talking about. Yep. Like that would throw off the entire board, right? For everyone, if if that were to happen, because uh, I think everyone kind of has them taken. You know, Marvin Harrison, if he were to fall at five, but I like it. I like it so far. So, so Joe Alt going there and beefing up the offensive line is just opening the door for Jim Harbaugh to draft Blake Corum as well, too, and just have him be there like and draft all the Michigan guys. So so, yeah, um, like uh, right now, like we're talking about we're talking about this and it's just literally it's just literally like, you know, again, just my thought process. Right. Like, I, I think, again, they want to run the football. Gus Edwards is the only running back there. I think they need to add another running back uh, it, again. You know, it's just it's Greg Roman. I guess I'm just scarred as a 49er fan with Greg Roman and everything. But all right. Let's move on. Uh, let's get to these next few picks, um, Rob. All right. I, I see Arizona going down and getting uh, Latu at edge at 11. I think that's good. I think that's good Hate for it. them. Hate it for I, me. I think it's Hate good it for, for the Niners. Uh, well, he's, he was never going to make it to 31. <laughs> uh, no, I know that. He's just yeah. such a great prospect. Perry and Arnold. Um, Fuaga, I see that. Uh, Verse. Brock Bowers, uh, 15. I This is the one that I struggled with a little bit because it does say that Seattle needs a cornerback, but they do have – Reek Willen, they do have Witherspoon. Uh, Mitchell does feel like a little bit of a luxury pick, a little bit. So uh, that one I could definitely see some pushback on. Uh, Fautino, uh, Latham, I got the I got the Rams going again 
and getting more offensive line with Amarius Mims. And then I see the Steelers um, plugging their hole with Deontay Johnson, leaving with Brian Thomas Jr. and the Dolphins with Byron Murphy the second. What do you think? Man, yeah, a crazy run on on tackles in, in just these 10 picks here. There's four going off the board um, and three in a row between 17 and 19. Like, And and Mims, like, that's pretty early, I think, for, for Mims of, of what I would expect him to go. But, like, mm. I could see it, too, because um, yeah. I know the Rams are doing their research on some of the top tackles in the draft. And, you know, if there is a run to go right before them, I think they would go for Mims there. I think it makes sense. He'd be the, the next one on the board. Again, I hate that for the 49ers, um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's sound. It, it all makes sense. Uh, yeah, the, the Seattle one getting a corner is interesting. Again, I love Quinny and Mitchell. He was awesome in, at the senior poll. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would hate that, but yeah, I mean, it, it looks good. Well, and I think the, the thought process with Mims is that he's going to sit a year because he does have such little film and production, right? So it's almost like that's a bit of a project. I don't know if the Rams are thinking the same exact way. But when you look at their needs, he's the next one on the board. And Dale says Mims is too risky. I agree. That is such a boomer bust home run pick. That's a home run or strikeout pick, literally. Um, you know, you can either get a generational tackle who is like this gifted guy, or you could get, you know, someone awful, right? Like, and I think that's the risk you take when it comes to that. So uh anything Rob else in um the, in these Rob yeah. in the private chat said Mims is a Trey Lance of tackles. I mean that's Mims is the Trey Lance of tackles. A... That's Why? A... What did Trey Lance do? Trey Lance is sitting somewhere <laughs> in his house, and he's just like, "What? What did I do? What did his I ears do? are burning." Do anything. Uh, <laughs> no, I That's mean so from the standpoint for. from the <laughs> from the standpoint of like Mims not having a lot of experience, but in that experience, he has looked great. Um, you know, yeah, eight starts. I it is a gamble for that reason, but he has all of the uh, not intangibles. I mean, like athletically. Tools. Yeah, I mean, he has he has everything else going for him. And so, yeah, you you work with that. And the Rams are that kind of team that this this pick at 19 wouldn't wouldn't hurt them if it didn't work no. out. And even if he had to sit a year or two, it also wouldn't really hurt him too bad. So mm, well, I, I'm, like going, it for them. I'm going off the process that also the Los Angeles Rams don't know what it's like to have a first round pick. So they're, they're <laughs> going to make a mistake, right? Like this is all brand new to them, right? Like, <laughs> so, but I, I do, I do think again, anyone who takes Mims is, is going to have to sit him. I mean, unless he just comes into the training camp and he starts kicking everyone's ass and then you have to start him. But I think that the way you're thinking about it is you just put him right there as a, as a developmental guy, you you're putting him in for the future and you don't have to pay him right away. So Let's move on. We're getting closer to the 49ers pick, and I can't wait for this one. Um, it's going to be later. So I got Chop Robinson going to edge uh, for the for the Eagles. Uh, Johnny Newton. Jackson Powers Johnson is a little bit interesting because it does seem like the Cowboys need an offensive tackle, but I think he's so good that you can't, like, really pass up on him at that spot. Nate Wiggins. Kool-Aid McKinstry, I think, falls to Tampa Bay. Adonna Mitchell goes to, to Arizona. Darius Robinson, they're in desperate need of an edge, so Buffalo will do that. Grant Barton um, would go to... The Lions, Tyler Guyton at 30, Jordan Morgan at 31, and Xavier Worthy at 32. So Jordan Morgan um, is the pick that I made for the 49ers. I uh, wrote up a draft profile for him, so I'll tell you what I what I think about him. Um, strengths are great explosion off the line, changes directions well, inc including laterally, can execute combo blocks, uh, which is a big fit for the 49ers, has the athleticism to kick out and pull on the outside zone, and possible flexibility to start at right tackle and then move over to left tackle eventually. The weaknesses are obviously arm length. Um, longer arm defensive ends are going to be able to get inside his body at the point of attack. His balance is a little bit of a concern at times, especially during contact. His base can get a little inconsistent and his hands just get a little too high for my liking um, with watching him. But I, I, I think that I think that the 49ers would be down with something like this because he can start at right tackle and then eventually possibly take over at left tackle. Well, okay. So the, the conversation around Morgan is an interesting one because there are some people who kind of think, you know, his eventual position in the NFL is at guard, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, he, he is someone though, as you mentioned, could be someone who can start maybe right away at right tackle or wherever, um, whatever side, obviously not the left, but he, he could compete with Colton McKibbitts right away. And then eventually, I'm sorry, move I'm just over. laughing. At, I'm laughing at Nick's comment. I'm sorry, that's just really funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. Uh, and eventually, move over to 
guard and that would be like his his eventual spot so like how do you how do you think of that like because if it's a a pick where you're starting him somewhat out not out of position because he has played tackle in college but like out of maybe what would be his best position um at the second level um like what what do you think about that and then moving off I think a lot of people are believing that he can start at right tackle. And when I say balance issues, I mean, like, he's not going to get thrown around. He just – he has some issues. And I think what a lot of people are forgetting too, right, is Mike McGlinchey, right, was taken number nine. And when you take a tackle at number nine, you need him to be – I don't know if you want to say generational, but you're looking for someone who is going to be a 10-year starter, right? Mm-hmm. Now, at 31 – you're taking someone who, you know, I, I see Nick's comment about, you know, it, it sounds like McGlinchey a little bit. Maybe it does. But Mike McGlinchey was a starter for the 49ers for a little while. I think we want to remember that. And you don't know if you're going to have to pay Jordan Morgan the type of money that Mike McGlinchey can command, right? Like, I think I think all of that needs to be contextualized with where you're taking them. Because at nine, you expect Mike McGlinchey to be around forever. And if he's not, then that looks bad. Um, At 31, if you're getting a starter, a NFL solid starter, if you're getting that, I think – you feel pretty good about that. Again, this is how I'm thinking right now. We have a little bit of more time when it comes to when we're saying, you know, free agency, some other things falling into place, you know, other things are about to happen. Then we can make another mock. But I think as of right now, when I'm looking around at this team and I'm looking and I see kind of what they need, I think, I think honestly, Jordan Morgan could fit. And I think, again, there's a lot of thinking because when I spoke with Matt Miller, Matt Miller said the same thing. Sure. Arm length is a strength is a, is a weakness, but he'll start at right tackle and then he can move over to left tackle. And he started talking about how it's kind of normal now in the league for it to happen with Paris Johnson and other guys. So, I mean, it's it's a thought process that I didn't live from him. But like now that I'm looking more and more into it and I, and I let the board play out and he was sitting there, um, I, I took him. So I, I think, again, I think everybody thinks that he's a better guard than tackle because he has shorter arms. I think that's yeah. what it is. But yeah. there are still ways to win with short arms. Like he doesn't have T Rex arms. Like uh, it's not it, it's not that small, right? Like it's it's in comparison to other tackles. Now the thing is, the way you do that is with great technique. You can overcome shortcomings like that with technique, and that's something that he's gonna have to learn and have to do at the next level. But it's not like he doesn't have, he doesn't have T Rex arms, you know. I, and I I I go back to this a little bit. The draft process has gotten these buzzwords in everybody's head about like <laughs> arm length and. And this and that and that and everyone said, "Hey, Aaron Donald's going to be too small to to play in this league. He's going to be too small. He's too little." Let's let's slow down a little bit, right? Like, how do you how do you, all right? So you can identify a weakness, but there are ways to get around that. It doesn't mean it's end all be all. And when you're looking at when you're looking at attributes, someone with shorter arms shouldn't just be like, "Oh, take them off the board. That's it," right? Like, it's this right, is what yeah. makes the the Forty Niners and the Forty Niners the draft such a crapshoot. This is what makes everything a crapshoot, right? Um, you have to scout the player. You have to scout the person. You have to figure out how they're going to, you know, how they're going to translate their game. And Dale says, hell, they said Dwight Freeney was way too small for the NFL and he was super dominant. Again, again, all of these things and the buzzwords. This is the annoying part of the draft uh, process right now. The buzzwords. Short arms. Uh, his cone. His shuttle. Uh, okay. That's one part of the process. But if you're taking people off the board because their arms are one inch shorter than someone else's, come on, guys. Like, let's let's evaluate. Let's properly look through it. And let's try to identify what you think he can translate well into. And it's not me, like, campaigning for Jordan Morgan because I actually just love watching wide receivers. I've watched way too many offensive tackles this entire draft, pro- draft process. It's not fun. I don't like. I don't enjoy it. It's not like I watch somebody get you know smashed into the ground. Like man, that was awesome. I, I that's not my bag, but I have to do it because the team needs. So honestly, right now when you're looking at this, it's just the, the buzzwords of like too small, arm length, um, cone speed, shuttle speed. Like all those things are just one part of the process. They're not the end all be all that takes them off the board stuff. Yeah, and and I think it, it it's definitely not enough to take him off the board. And I think like. Aside from that, his his tape, his, his athletic profile, um, 
you know, do fit in with what the 49ers typically look for in their offensive linemen. So it, it would be a good fit. And so at 31, if he's there and say like a Kool-Aid McKinstry is, is not there, uh, then yeah, I, I think it would be a, a great pick. Interesting enough, like I, I saw Tony Pauline, like he, he put out, he's an NFL draft analyst for those not aware. Um, he put out a tweet saying like he had a visit with the Broncos. Um, and so he also said in that tweet, unless they trade down in the first round, I can't see this happening. And I was like, damn, like, really? Like, could he even make it a 31 then? And he said, like, here, here's what he said. Doubt it. Won't get past 36. Um, so even him getting the 31 seems like it, it might be difficult. So that, that makes 31 really interesting for the 49ers. Like, a lot of the guys that they could maybe want there would be taken. That's why, like, if we want to talk about trading up now, I mean, that that still is a possibility, too. And I want to talk about the plausible range of a, a trade yeah. up, because I don't think we're talking about getting into the teens. You would have to nope. give up way too much to get into the teens. But I think if there's someone they like, even three spots ahead, like yeah. someone who they think will not get there to 31, I think that's worth it. I, I even think they can go as far as, you know, mid mid 20s. Yeah, I would say 25 is a sweet spot. Um, but again, it would have to be someone that, that they identify. I would ask you this and I, I'm going to ask the chat this as well, too. You have a chance to get yourself a Kool-Aid McKinstry. Take Jordan Morgan, Tyler Guyton. Let's put those three up there like those three up there. Uh, what what do you think? What do you what would what would you prefer? Are you saying for 31 or to trade up? No, no, no. Like moving up. Like if there's if like, let's say all three of those guys are on the board and the 49ers have them on their board, but they have a chance to move up. And what they would trade up with is their comp picks, um, their second rounder. They can absolutely do it. No questions asked, especially because it's a few, it's a few spots up. Like it's, they have so many picks like they, and they don't need third round picks. They don't need yeah. third round picks because yeah. they just light them on fire anyway at this point. Um, So let's say they move up and they have those three people on the board. Tyler Guyton. Jordan Morgan, Kool-Aid McKinstry, what would you like them to, to target? It it needs to be someone who you know almost for a fact. I know we talk about the draft being a crapshoot, and it is. But it, if you're trading up, like it has to be someone you are sure about. And so I think I would go McKinstry just because – and, you know, I'm you, you're only giving me that hypothetical, but I don't think I would move up. For him in that mm -hmm. case like I think I'd probably just stay at 31 um and see if he were to fall I don't think he does but um yeah if if I had to make the choice to trade up between one of those three guys I'd go Kool-Aid um just because if you look at the corners beyond 2024 no one besides like Darrell Luter Samuel Womack who I think I mean he he's probably done after this year too um mm -hmm. I mean, is on the roster. So they they definitely need someone, someone who's going to be a for sure thing, an impactful player. Um, and it doesn't have to be right away in 2024, but if you know he's going to be your starter and he's going to be a really good starter 2025 and beyond, I, I would say that's worth it. Tyler Guyton would intrigue me because it's an area of need, but at the same time, I think the 49ers are more comfortable with the offensive line than us fans are. And so I might think it's a bigger need than the 49ers do. I don't think they would go with, with Tyler Guyton. I don't even know if Tyler Guyton would be impactful enough to, to beat out, you know, Colton McKibbitts right away. Right. Again, it needs to be someone you're sure could, right. could compete with who you have there already and would be able to start potentially day one at the very worst, you know, the following year. So um, right. for that reason, I think I would go Kool-Aid. Yeah, and, you know, when you look at these offensive linemen and everyone, you know, there's kind of something in everyone's head that the 49ers are just running it back with their offensive line. No, they're casting out their safety net. And I think we've talked about this a few times. They're casting out their safety net because the draft is weird. And if people start to have a run on an offensive lineman and then you can't get one of those guys, you at least want to say, we have a baseline offensive line that still made the Super Bowl this past year. Like, we want to be able to have that. But that doesn't mean that the 49ers are going to preclude themselves from getting an offensive lineman. And that doesn't mean that an offensive lineman can't walk in day one and kick someone's ass and then knock somebody out. 
right? Like everyone points to Colin McKibbitt's money of like one year, $7 million. It's very possible that that money is for him to just be uh, the utility guy that Brunskill was in a pinch. If you need someone who can play guard real quick, if you need to play a uh, right tackle, if you need to play left tackle, you have someone that can bounce around. $7 million isn't starter money. And it's, I guarantee you, if a rookie comes in and he starts to kick ass in training camp, he is going to start. If he's the best player on the field, he's going to start. Spencer Burford started right away. Obviously, we're not as in love with him right now when, when it comes to like what he's done. But if you literally are looking at this team, there is definitely a way for an offensive lineman to come in here and start right away. But you don't want to bank on that. You don't want to have to bank on that. So, again, essentially, right now, this is all hypotheticals, but the 49ers still have all these possibilities. Trade up, stay there, you know, uh, offensive line. Uh, all this to say the 49ers are probably just going to take another defensive lineman, and we're all going to argue about it and hate about it. Don't you think, Steph? Yeah, it's it's crazy because we do this literally every year where we're like, this is the position of need, guys. Uh -huh. This is what they're going to draft with the first pick. Um, and – they they never do that <laughs> and not only do they not do that but they end up drafting another position and usually some obscure guy that like no one had ever even mocked before <laughs> to the 49 like it uh -huh. i mean i don't know if they they're trolling us at this point like oh I'm yeah just they are. Convinced. i'm convinced they just look at all our mocks and i was like how about we do this instead <laughs> yeah well, I think the way that and the way that honestly that John Lynch explained it was is we just draft good football players and we don't really care where they are. So their value is just like the, it, their values all across the board. Like it's all up and yeah. down and it's not how we value it. Right. Again, that's what makes this so much fun. That's what makes this great discussion. Me and Steph have been able to do a offseason show 45 minutes. I think that's great. I think that's hard enough in its own. Yeah. And. This offseason, we don't have to argue about quarterbacks. We can actually get into watching draft prospects and actually carry, like, and we have first round picks. This is so much fun. Look at this. Look at us. The things that we're going to be fighting about is who we think should be the draft pick, our mocks, but not about the quarterbacks. You know, fans aren't going to be doxing each other over their quarterback takes. At least that's one positive step in 49ers Twitter land. And Dale says finally no quarterback issues. But <laughs> there it is, guys. Mark, you know, mock me in the in the comments and everything. Just uh, my first one. I'll do a few more. Um, I just... <laughs> Please screenshot that and keep it. It looks like Rob already did, so that's great. Guys, that's literally going to be when the, 49ers select, when the 49ers select a defensive tackle at 31. That's literally going to be Rob's face. <laughs> like, that's it. Guys, keep that, please. Please keep that. Um, but, hey. Steph, thanks, guys, uh, for tuning in. Uh, 47 minutes in is probably a good place to end it. Make sure you guys like this video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to Gold Standard Podcast Network, wherever you get your audio podcasts. Make sure you're going to goldstandardniners.com to vote for Brad or Croc in the media uh, madness bracket. Um, hey, you know, give Steph Sanchez a YouTube follow and a Twitter follow at Steph, Steph49K. Maybe do the same for me. That'd be all right. Jason Aponte and Jason Aponte 2103. But for Steph, for Jay, we're out of here. Thank you, guys. Peace.